Let's head for Montague Square, where so much rock and roll history took place. Jumping in the cab. <laughs> I just got in the wrong cab, you guys. I, oh my God. Tom is laughing, look at him. I'm so sorry, Tom. Look, he's dying laughing. I got the wrong cab. <laughs> do you know how many times I do this? All the time I get in the wrong cars, all the time. It's a thing I do. <laughs> right, I'm in the right one now, you guys. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning, everyone. Look at this beautiful, beautiful day. Ladies and gents, I'm on the move. I am super excited. Today, I'm in St. John's Wood, and I am about to take a black cab tour of London. And we are going to work with an amazing YouTuber, Tom the Taxi Driver. And we're going to collaborate today. He's going to take me all over London. And I'm going to bring you to some of the most famous Beatles sites in London. Now, it's a glorious day. I'm meeting Tom down here in the cab shelter. Slightly intimidating. I'll be surrounded by all these black cab drivers. Amazing guys, though. Their knowledge is exquisite. So stay tuned. We start our tour in St. John's Wood, where we will pay a short visit to Paul McCartney's house before walking across Abbey Road to Abbey Road Studios. We next head to Marleybone to visit sites made famous in the opening scene of A Hard Day's Night before stopping at a registry office that has witnessed three Beatles weddings. After that, we visit the site I'm most excited about, a house where Ringo Starr, Chas Chandler, Jimi Hendrix, and John and Yoko all lived at one time or another and where the famous drug bust took place all before heading to Mayfair to see the only house where all four Beatles lived together simultaneously. And finally we head to Savile Row where the Beatles played their final gig together before ending our tour where the term Beatlemania was coined the London Palladium. Be sure to check out our blog post on the Beatles sites in London and where you can find a map with these stops and many more. A link is in the description below. Right guys, so I've arrived and I've got Tom and Tom, my sat nav boys for the day. This is my ride. Look at this epic black cab. And the boys are going to navigate me all over London today. An epic ride with these two lovely lads. I'm delighted actually because I never really take black cabs. But Tom, hi Tom. Tom going? has his own channel and the other Tom here is a, what have you got, an Osmo Pocket Mobile? Oh, a very handy little gadget. They're going to be filming each other for the day for Tom's channel. Now check out Tom's YouTube channel, Tom the Taxi Driver. Uh, he navigates his way around the streets of London on a daily basis. I'm going to be talking to him the whole day today and we'll get some info from him. Tom, do you mind telling me just a little bit about where we are and the uh, taxi cab shelter behind you? Today, yeah, I wanted to start you off here because it's a wonderful piece of street furniture going back to the 19th century. These are cabin shelters and when they were first instigated, a gentleman called Lord Palmerston who brought these into, into London. Oh, it was Lord Palmerston? Yeah, I believe it's Lord Palmerston. Someone might correct me if not. But um, the taxi drivers of the day, it was quite a tough job for them to do. Uh, they would be on top of the handsome cabs of the day, um, getting subject to the, the wind, the rain, to the snow, really awful conditions. So rather than actually driving cabs, the cab drivers would often go to the pub and frequently get pissed. Um, so it was very hard for people to get a cab. And if they did manage to get one, the driver would be heavily intoxicated or they might have just given the reins over to some small child uh, so this was Lord Palmerston's doing he installed about 50 of these across London and it was a way of encouraging cabbies to come and get a hot meal uh, sometimes we say actually in the cab trade uh, that um, to have a hot meal or for a driver to have a break is called a Churchill because uh, apparently it was Winston Churchill who actually instigated the right that cab drivers could stop and get a hot oh, meal. So it's kind of a bit of cabby slang wrapped in there. Very good. But there's still 13 of these across London, the grey two listed, so they're going to be uh, well, hopefully a permanent part of London for, forevermore. So do spot them the next time you're out and about. Right, thank you, Tom. Um, that's epic info. So what we're going to do today, you guys, is we're going to start off, I think, with Abbey Road. Does that sound good, Tom? Yeah, is that all right? Uh, or would you want to do... Cavendish Road. Yeah, we'll go there. Right, so we're going to go to the home of Paul McCartney. Let's go uh, stalk Paul McCartney's house. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we met him this morning, you guys? So, next stop, London Cab Journey with the boys. So, we're actually on the move, you guys. We're going to head to our first location. Tom has it all. He's going to navigate the way for me, which is amazing. 
now from St. John's Wood Church Gardens, where we are starting from, to the home of Sir Paul McCartney is just a hop, skip and a jump. Right, so Tom's just dropped me off and I'm absolutely in awe of the fact that I'm standing in front of the home of Paul McCartney here on Cavendish Avenue. It's number seven actually, please my apologies, not number 17. Even though all the houses look the same, but uh, yeah, he moved in here in the 1960s and he only paid £40,000 for this beautiful home at the time. Now in one of the most exclusive residences here in London. Very short stroll to Abbey Road, which we're going to be heading to next, you guys. And this, should I knock, knock, knock on the door? Sorry, that was a bit corny, you guys. But uh, yeah, the amazing home of Sir Paul McCartney here. So that will dispute the fact that he had died, which was a rumour that we'll talk a little bit more about when we head to Abbey Road. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm in close proximity. If he is in, how amazing would that be? Number seven, Cavendish Avenue. Next up, I'm gonna get Tom to take us to Abbey Road. Here we go. Once more, another short drive ahead from McCartney's London home to the famous Abbey Road Crosswalk. We also have a blog post that details how you can visit on your own, which we will also leave a link to. So our next stop today, you guys, is the iconic Abbey Road. I mean, the highlight for any Beatles fan in London. Now, Tom's just dropped me off, but here in front of us is that iconic pedestrian crossing where the four Beatles on the front cover of the Abbey Road album in 1969 are seen crossing that pedestrian crossing. Now, I have done a video on this already, ladies and gents, um, but it was Ian Macmillan who took the shot and he stood here in the centre of the road on the 8th of August in 1969. Now, it is, I guess it's the bane of a lot of motorists. This is listed, meaning that this pedestrian crossing is protected. And Abbey Road Studios have suggested up to 300,000 people a year cross this crossing. And they're always crossing it uh, morning, noon and night, essentially. So that's an estimated 1,000 people a day cross the crossing here on Abbey Road. Now, there were several rumours over the years about the Volkswagen Beetle that was in the background of that shot. And we'll put up a picture of that just so as you know what I mean. And it was more to do with the number plate there. There was a rumor that Paul McCartney had had a horrendous row with the Beatles, had stormed out, was in a car accident and was decapitated. Now, all these theories, this massive conspiracy went around in 1969 and they suggested that the Beatles were using an imposter. The imposter's name was William Campbell and he had won a Paul McCartney lookalike contest and they suggested that the Beatles were using him because they were afraid that the popularity and the fame of the Beatles would be affected by the death of Paul McCartney. All a bit ridiculous, really. But the idea behind the number plate, uh, which was LMW28IF, was Linda McCartney weeps and 28 if Paul McCartney had survived this car crash. So it really did gain a lot of traction, this rumour. It was all over the press. Um, it was all a bit ridiculous, actually, and some would even go as far as to say the four Beatles crossing the crossing was a representation of Paul McCartney's funeral. And George Harrison was said to be the grave digger, Ringo Starr, the undertaker, John Lennon, the preacher. And as Paul McCartney was in an old suit and he was barefoot, this was to represent how the dead are buried. Now, people also said that Paul McCartney was holding a cigarette as he was crossing that road in his right hand. And people also suggested this was all part of the rumour as well, because, well, Paul McCartney is famously left-handed. But it's all a bit ridiculous, but that was the rumour suggested. But of course, 1969, the front covered the Abbey Road album. Now, of course, the reason we're here is the Abbey Road Studios, right across the road. Now, this iconic place wasn't always known as Abbey Road Studios. It was actually known as EMI. But after the success of the Abbey Road album, that's when they changed its name to Abbey Road. Now, of course, the Beatles first came here to record in 1962. Thank you, guys. You're fine uh, with George Martin. But they recorded some of their iconic albums, the majority of their albums, up until 1969 in here. Now, the recording studios are in the back, 
and this one in particular here is recording studio one and this is where they recorded all you need is love and as it was the british um, participation actually in the our world which was a concert that was streamed all over the world and over 400 million people saw the recording where they recorded well they played live and um all you need is love and the lyrics were quite simplistic actually by John Lennon uh, because that was to well basically cater to the international audience so they could all understand what they were saying now studio one is this one studio two is where they recorded Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and during that recording it is said that John Lennon um, had wanted some of the the fans followed the Beatles everywhere they went and he had wanted some female vocals um, for the song Across the Universe. So he decided to come out here, and what he did was he asked a couple of the fans if any of them could sing, brought them in, and two of those girls said they could, and as a result, they ended up being the female backing vocals for Across the Universe. How amazing is that? Could you imagine being one of those fans? Now, the recording studio has seen some amazing artists over the years, apart from the Beatles. One of my favorite albums was recorded in there. Well, two of them, actually. Radiohead recorded OK Computer and the Benz in there. I think OK Computer is amazing. But it's also seen um, a lot of movie soundtracks, like Lord of the Rings, Return of the Jedi. Um, oh, I believe you too, actually. They recorded in there as well with Green Day. They recorded The Saints Are Coming. And that was for the hurricane, the victims of Hurricane Katrina. But this is what's on the wall at the moment. Now, this wall is painted over six times a year. Now, in a previous video, I said 365 times a year. Please forgive me, you guys. I got a lot of abuse for that one, but uh, it was one of my first and I was a bit, no, you're okay, come ahead. Um, it was a bit, I was really nervous. I'm always a bit nervous when I'm doing these, but alas, look at the wall here. So I'm gonna obviously leave my mark. Again, painted over six times a year, but the incredible Abbey Road Studios. Now, I mean, obviously I got here in the black taxi cab today, but if you were coming yourself, you just go as far as St. John's Wood. St. John's Wood Station is on the Jubilee Line. It's very, very quick to access, but this beautiful day here. Um, now, getting back to the, let's just see some of these fabulous tributes here to the Beatles and people leaving their mark uh, little bits and pieces so I love IG to Noel Gallagher people are referencing Noel Gallagher here but so many people come to visit this iconic site ladies and gents now it's been rumored that over the years as well I might try and go around him can I go around him Ooh, very quickly thank you um it's been rumored. well it's not rumored actually um the barefoot paul mccartney the reason he was barefoot in that picture they say is it was just an exceptionally hot day now a lot of people do the same thing they go barefoot across the crossing a lot more people would you believe some people uh, you two and green day walked across that crossing in an iconic shot and i don't have a shot of this i wouldn't mind having it though the red hot chili peppers walked across that crossing naked ladies and gents so uh Anthony Kiedis okay um right less said about that the better but you can hear the uh, glee in my voice so that's Abbey Road ladies and gents um for further information I do do another video on Abbey Road on the website so we'll be off to our next stop coming up we've already been to Paul McCartney's house and just to let you know it's just a short little walk around there from Cavendish Avenue, where Paul McCartney's house is. And uh, that is the protected Beatles Crossing, ladies and gents, and the incredible Abbey Road Studios. Coming up next stop is a surprise. Stay tuned, I'm jumping back in my taxi with Tom and Tom and heading to the next iconic Beatles site. Now we head south into the London district of Marylebone, one of our longest drives of this tour. I actually haven't yet done a video of Marylebone, so let me know in the comments if you would like to see one. Our next stop, ladies and gents, is here at Boston Place. And right down here, some of you Beatles fanatics will recognize this. This is where they did the opening scenes 
for the movie of A Hard Day's Night. You'll remember the Beatles are running down this street um, as fast as they can, trying to escape their maniac fans who are chasing them down the street. George Harrison actually trips in that and he brings Ringo Starr with him, much to the amusement of the other Beatles. And you can see they're laughing and skidding laughing at them tripping over. And that is because it wasn't scripted. That wasn't part of the script, but they went with it in the end anyway, when they opened the movie scene. Um, the fans that day actually had been here awaiting the arrival of the Beatles and no one knows how they even knew they were on the way. Um, no one knows how the fans knew the Beatles were going to be here, but they seem to be the eyes and ears of the Beatles. As Paul McCartney had said, the Beatles fans were the eyes and ears of the Beatles. Um, but they showed up on the day, hundreds of screaming, adoring fans. And they used some of the fans for that opening scene and rewarded them by giving them signed autographs. So that's on Boston Place. But where do the Beatles go next? So the Beatles head straight down the street and they run directly in to this beautiful building, ladies and gents. This is Marleybone Station. Now, Marleybone Station was opened in 1899. And I guess it's the, the least traffic comes through Marleybone Station. It's not one of those really manic ones, but it's one of the stations on the Monopoly board, actually. One of the terminuses on the Monopoly board. But the fans themselves, now they've done a lot of filming here. 39 steps they filmed here as well, I believe. But the, the Beatles run straight in here trying to avoid the screaming adoring fans and let's just go straight in and I'll bring you over here where there's a Marks and Spencers now this Marks and Spencers which is coming up here on the left hand side it's so beautiful in here you guys this is one of my favorite train stations in London but the M&S station is right down here oh not M&S my apologies it's the yes it is actually it's Marks and Spencers this would have been the main entrance. So the Beatles would have ran right through here. And there used to be three telephone boxes just inside the door of Marks and Spencers. And I'll show you there on the wall where they used to be. And this is where John, George and Ringo are seen hiding inside in these telephone boxes from the screaming, adoring fans as they run right past them. Now then they run out of here and they head straight down into the Starbucks. There's a famous still from there as well. And you can see them looking out the door. It was just a coffee shop at the time. And they're looking at the fans running past. Now, where was Paul McCartney in the middle of all of this? Paul McCartney was actually on a bench right here in the middle of the station. And he was in this rather hilarious disguise with a mustache and a beard. And he's reading a newspaper. But it was all part of the opening scenes of the 1964 highly successful it was a really successful movie a hard day's night and of course the album had great success afterwards but this as i say would have been the main entrance so that ladies and gents is another stop on our beatles tour where do the beatles go next they run then onto a train on platform one but this was filmed on a sunday and at the time 1964 no trains ran on a Sunday. So the train actually didn't move, but uh, the station had been closed. It was Sunday. And that is the next stop. So all of these are very accessible to you folks if you want to do this tour yourself or self-guide. And the opening scenes of the very successful Beatles movie, A Hard Day's Night. So I'm going to head out to Tom. We're going to move on to our next stop. And again, we'll keep it all as a surprise until we arrive straight out. But the Marleybone station, just for your own point of reference, is on the Bakerloo line. So if you're not taking taxis, you can get the Bakerloo line northbound. Here we have it, the beautiful Marleybone station. So just a short journey from Marleybone Station. Tom is going to bring us around now to Marleybone Registry Office. And I'll tell you something, it's an absolute pleasure for a change having a black cab driver showing me around. I don't have to navigate and find these areas myself. Their knowledge is incredible, you guys. So if you're ever stuck for a taxi in London, you know who the hell. The boys know every street corner here. And it's making the day a lot easier as well. Um, so we're going next to the site of three Beatles weddings. So all I have to do 
is literally jump out of the cab, tell you the info, and Tom does all the work. So next up, Three Beatles Weddings. And be sure to check out Tom's channel, where he chronicles his daily life as a London taxi driver, covering topics like preparing for the taxi knowledge exam, vehicle maintenance, earnings, as well as videos on navigating London's crazy streets. It's really a unique channel worth checking out. He is also a tour guide, and you could hire him for London taxi tours. His links are in the description. Guys, so we're heading down here and there's already a gorgeous bride here who's just got married in Marleybone Town Hall and Marleybone Registry Office. So, but it was also the site of two weddings. You see the bride there? I was hoping I would maybe get an interview with her. Two weddings of Paul McCartney and one wedding of Ringo Starr. Isn't she gorgeous? Let's have a look. Oh, bless her. Beautiful dress. Yeah, so here we are, Westminster Council House. And this is on Marleybone Road. And hi, congratulations, you guys. So also the site of the wedding of Paul McCartney. Let's just see what it says here. Westminster City Council, in recognition of the steadfast endurance of the people of Westminster during World War II. The plaque was unveiled in the Lord Mayor's of Westminster City Council. Okay, that's not why we're here. We are actually here because on the steps here was where, well, it's not on the steps actually, Paul McCartney married Linda here on the 12th of March in 1969. Linda, his first wife, of course, and the mother of his children. And there were so many fans outside the front here, folks, screaming and crying because he actually was the last Beatle to get married. <laughs> Why are you girls crying? Well, married for the first time, that is. And the fans were devastated because they had missed their golden opportunity, their last opportunity to marry one of the Beatles. So, so many fans showed up. Would you believe they showed up in a black taxi cab and they had to go around the back and enter into their wedding in uh, past the rubbish bins in the back. But alas, a very happy marriage. But Linda, of course, died of breast cancer. Bless her. And then Paul McCartney got remarried in here when he married Nancy Chevelle, his current wife. And the dress actually she wore that day was designed by his own daughter, Stella McCartney. And the pictures on the day were pictures taken by his daughter, another very famous renowned photographer, Mary McCartney. So the other Beatle that got married here was in 1981. And that is when Ringo Starr married the famous actress, actually, uh, what was her name again? Oh, Barbara Bach. You'll be familiar with her actually because she was uh, she was one of the Bond girls in the Doctor No movie. And Barbara Bach, when he married Barbara Bach in 1981, it wasn't long after the death of John Lennon in New York, and the Beatles had been really depressed and in mourning of John, of course, it was a horrendous thing to happen in 1981 in New York. So it was the first time they all got together, and fans were desperate for that actual image, that first image of the three Beatles together. Okay where the Beatles got married. I'm quite envious of that girl getting married in there. She looked really lovely. But getting married in the same spot, imagine, as the Beatles. I believe Stella Black, she's a, she was a famous TV, Liverpoolian TV presenter here in the UK. I believe she got married in there, but I'm sure there's several others as well. Now, Tom is waiting on me here. We're gonna hail him down. He's gonna take us to our next stop. And this is one of the more favors, a famous, and one of my favorites, let's head from Montague Square, where so much rock and roll history took place. Jumping in the cab. <laughs> I just got in the wrong cab, you guys. I, oh my God, Tom is laughing, look at him. I'm so sorry, Tom. Look, he's dying laughing, I got the wrong cab. <laughs> do you know how many times I do this? 
all the time. I get in the wrong cars all the time. It's a thing I do. <laughs> right, I'm in the right one now, you guys. Now we will take a short four minute ride south of the registry building to a stop that I'm going to visit for the very first time today. Right, my lovely. So this is going to be one of the most exciting stops on the tour for me. I have never actually been here. I've read so much about it and I've never even come up here. So thankfully, because of you guys, I'm here today and I feel a bit overwhelmed about the amount of history that took place in the house right behind us. Now, let me just show you where we are. So, turn you around. So, right here, you got Montague Place. This is Upper Montague Street. And this, look at this gorgeous neighborhood, you guys, is Montague Square. And what I wanted to show you is right over here is number 34. And number 34, what was well is where so much rock and roll history took place now the blue heritage plaque on the wall was unveiled by yoko ono only in recent years she was quite emotional when she came here and i'll tell you why in just a moment it's because where she lived with john for a period of time but this apartment now the ground floor and the basement you see below the railings here let's go a little closer so you can see it now the police are coming in the background so let's just see so the basement here I mean, to be this close to this much rock and roll history is absolutely mind-blowing. So this is 30, 34 Montague Square. Now, we'll start with the original. Ringo Starr was the one that bought this apartment. And Ringo bought this apartment and lived here with his first wife, Maureen. Actually, she gave birth to her first son whilst living in this address. And their son is Zach, actually. He's a famous drummer now as well following in the footsteps of his father, Ringo Starr. Let me move back again to give you a good view of it. And they lived here for a period of time until Ringo moved out to the countryside. And Ringo used this pad though. He kept this pad though for their late night recording sessions when he would be recording with the Beatles in London. And he'd come in uh, from the country. I believe he lived outside by John Lennon for a period of time. So then it was occupied, but he lived in here around 1965. So when Ringo uh, wasn't here, he would lease the property out to friends. And Paul McCartney actually used the studio. He had a recording studio in the basement there of 34 Montague Square. And it's where we believe he um, worked on Eleanor Rigby in there. When he moved his recording studio out, another chap that moved in, was a gentleman by the name of Chaz Chandler, the bass player with the animals. And he used it as a crash pad, shall we say, or a temporary pad for him and a guitar player, a very famous guitar player. He had only recently discovered in Greenwich Village in New York City and he brought back to London. And that was James Marshall Hendrix. So they lived here for a period of time as well when Jimmy first came to town. He had discovered Jimmy, of course, in a club in New York. He had got into the uh, music agent industry. The animals were doing quite well, but he decided he'd capitalize on his fame. And he had a look around London and didn't see anyone he liked. So he went to New York City and that's where he discovered a black American guitarist playing rock and roll music, which was quite unusual at the time because black artists were usually inclined towards soul, Motown and jazz, because that's, well, basically what it was at the time. But. Uh, he approached Jimmy and he told him the scene was London. Get your butt over here, they would love him. And he came here with him. Now, Jimmy lived here as well for a period of time with his girlfriend, Kathy. Uh, they were eventually evicted from noise and the landlord wasn't too pleased about the parties they were having and the arguments they were having, notorious for that. So amazing to think, not only Ringo Starr and his wife, Paul McCartney recorded in the basement here and then Chaz Chandler and Jimi Hendrix, but I'm not done yet. Ooh, nice car coming up here, you guys. Let's have a quick look. This is the place for cars. But years later, when John and Yoko first met, you guys, John and Yoko moved in here temporarily while they were looking for a new home for themselves. And it's famously where they took those naked photographs, which were quite graphic at the time. Well, they'd be graphic even today, but in the 1960s, they were very graphic for the front cover of the album Two Virgins. They were even brought in with the uh, 
head of the record company was not happy about it. Actually, he suggested, he said, well, at the very least, if you were going to use naked bodies, why can't you find more attractive ones? But the most infamous event that took place in here was John. I love the way people always want to get involved in this YouTube video. John and Yoko one morning woke up at early hours of the morning. It was about eight o'clock in the morning. And the banging was on the door. And now they came down, they looked outside and there was eight police officers outside. This was the scene of the infamous drug bust uh, for John Lennon. Now, what people don't realize about this drug bust was on the day, John Lennon had been tipped off two days earlier by a journalist. So he had cleaned out the apartment of any drug paraphernalia that was in there. Yet, so you can imagine how surprised he was when they found a small quantity of marijuana in there. Sergeant Pilchard was the one who arrested him. And I mean, coincidentally, it's, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing. A News of the World reporter, which we know in recent years, the News of the World has been closed down for hacking and for bribing police officers. But alas, this News of the World reporter happened to be passing by and took photos of John Lennon's arrest. Now, it's widely believed that Pilchard actually planted the drugs in the apartment. But then again, there was a possibility it could have been a bit of marijuana that had been left from a previous tenant. I mean, several others had lived there. Ringo had lived there. Paul had been there and uh, Jimi Hendrix had been there. But alas, he was arrested and Yoko was heavily pregnant. Um, he decided he'd plead guilty so that the Yoko would be left out of the conviction because there was a danger she could be deported as an illegal alien. And that conviction stood with him. Now, a 550 pounds is all he was fined, which was not a problem. But it was years later it was going to come back to haunt him because in 1971, when they moved to New York City, John and Yoko campaigned all the time. And we know about the bed protests, but they campaigned against the Vietnam War. Um, they were also um, very involved in the campaign about, uh, well, an anti-Nixon campaign um, where they campaigned for him not to be re-elected. Nixon took this very badly. He sent a memo to the FBI and looking for ways to deport John Lennon. So the FBI found this drug bust and they attempted a deportation order was signed. But little did they know the popularity of John Lennon in New York City was, um, well, effectively through the roof. People love John Lennon. And a massive campaign ensued, allegedly also involved in that campaign was the mayor of New York City at the time, to keep John Lennon in New York City and in the United States. So it took him four years to get his green card. So. I mean, that illegal drug bus, well, it wasn't an illegal drug bus. They had a warrant, they did get in, but that drug bus, which most likely was planted, definitely caused a lot of trouble for John Lennon years later. Um, those years that he was in New York, he couldn't come home either at that time because of his lack of a green card. It was really quite sad, really, restricting someone, but he loved New York and he ended up staying there. And of course, we all know he died there in 1981. He was assassinated there. Very tragic end to an incredible life and such an interesting life. But the home of Charles Chandler, Ringo Starr, recording studio of Paul McCartney and a temporary home of John Lennon and Yoko. That, ladies and gents, is 34 Montague Square. Put that on your Beatles list. Right, Tom is waiting for me somewhere. I'm going to find Tom. He's going to take us to our next stop. But well, we're going to head a bit further in towards Westminster now. I was trying to concentrate today on bringing you to locations that we hadn't been to. Um, so, but I will bring you around some of the more familiar spots as well, because I want to make this kind of a, a really big comprehensive tour of the Beatles. Ladies and gents, next stop. Where am I going next? Oh, we're going to go to Green Street, I think, where all four Beatles managed to live together. And here is Tom. It's like having a personal chauffeur today, guys. It's brilliant. These guys are great. Our next stop is just a five minute short ride to the beautiful Mayfair district of London. If you haven't already watched it, check out my video on Mayfair. A link to it is in the description below.
So the next stop in our whirlwind uh, Beatles tour, you guys, is this incredible property here on Green Street, just off of Mayfair. And it's number 57, right here. Can you believe Tom, the cab driver, literally brought me right outside the door. And on the top floor was an apartment or a flat, flat L, and in 1963, Brian Epstein bought this for all four Beatles after their second number one, She Loves You. So this is the only place in the entire of London where all four Beatles live together at the same time. Uh, there's a famous image of them leaning over the balcony here as well. Beatles fans, fans can be quite our vandals, essentially. And we will see later on, you know, in Abbey Road where they have to keep repainting over the wall because everybody wants to leave their mark on a Beatles site in London. But also you'll see at number three, Savile Row, the door had to be replaced four times from Beatles fans leaving their personal messages. But look at this, even Beatles fans chip away bits of the pavement. Can you believe that? To keep it as souvenirs. But I do kind of get it to be fair because when they replaced the um, courtyard of Mitre Square in the Jack the Ripper tour. I took a cobblestone from there as well. But anyway, getting back to the boys, all four of them live together here on Green Street, ladies and gents, the only apartment ever in London. So you'll often get Beatles fans down here, which is a pretty cool sight and pretty infamous knowing they all lived in this building. But look at all the properties along here. Stunning, stunning properties now. Super, super expensive in this immediate area. But look at my ride there. There is Tom and Tom. They're filming their own video today of how they get around to these routes. So we'll uh, put a link in the description to Tom's YouTube channel as well. He's been amazing today, bringing me to all these amazing sites. So let's move on again, because it's getting a little bit noisy here. I wanna take you past the Hilton and we're gonna head for Soho and Savile Row. Right, you guys, so we're on the move again and we're heading through Mayfair now because Tom has a lot of diversions to put up with in London. You forget how difficult it can be to navigate here. Now, I did work on the open top buses for a period of time, so I know what it's like when you're diverted all the time, but these boys, incredible. I mean, you'd always have a controller working out the diversions for the drivers, but these guys are, have to work them out in a split second. So Tom is gonna bring me along Park Lane now. I'm not gonna get out at the Hilton, because it's just a small stop, but we're gonna make our way then towards Savile Row and uh, just have a quick chat here with Tom again about driving in London and see, I have a couple of questions for him actually, just bear with me. Right Tom, so I know from experience of working on black cabs or on the open top buses years ago that, I mean, how many diversions? Is there always something in London that is diverted? Yeah, you work out something, right? It might be a brand new, fresh diversion. Okay. Oh, right, okay. I've worked it out now. I've got it. And then the next day, that diversion will still be in place, but then everyone else's kind of sat nav has then caught up. Okay. So, what was then the best diversion that day is then awful the next day. Oh, so my it, God. It's always just about having multiple options. And, and does your patience not go? I mean, you seem very chilled for a cab driver in London in this crazy traffic and stuff. It's when you run out of options, I find. Okay. If you then just have to sit in one option and you think, well, I've got no further options. This is the road I have to take. There's no other option. That's when it gets a bit stressful. But, you know, okay. I just kind of let the, the passenger know exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, like, so we've laid out the route here. Even just getting to this point on Grosvenor Square, there was another option I could have taken rather than Grosvenor Square, but that's been shut for building works. But you love what you do though, I mean it chills, right? You do love this job. I compare it to, when I was a kid I used to play um, Grand Theft Auto a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when you play those games so much, you learn like that map inside out and it's it's awesome. You just drive without thinking. Okay, go, I've okay. I, that just shows his age, uh, ladies and gents. If he said that when he was a kid, Grand Theft Auto came out. When I was a kid, the computer was invented. So it just shows the difference in age between us. Right, folks. So here's the London Hilton on Park Lane. Formerly one of the tallest hotels in London, but that's been taken over now by the Shard, the Shangri-La and the Shard. 
Uh, the Queen wasn't too happy about the top floor of this, actually, because you could see into the gardens of Buckingham Palace. But it's in here where the Beatles met their spiritual guru. Now, I am going to pronounce this properly wrong. And uh, please forgive me to any of my friends that are offended. The Maharishi Maharaja. It's in here where they met him inside in the London Hilton. But just another little bit of rock and roll trivia, actually. This is also where the very famous Elvis Costello was discovered outside the front of the Hilton Hotel, busking outside the front door. So, London Hilton on Park Lane. Now we have, I will be doing a tour. I actually have done a tour walking along here and showing you all the monuments along the way. But it's a stunning part and where we're headed next, it brings us right in there to High Park Corner. We're gonna drive along Piccadilly make our way towards Soho and Savile Row. There's Tom. Let's head off again. We are now heading to Soho to one of the most important moments in the history of the Beatles. I covered Savile Row and Soho in one of my previous videos. A link to this video can be found in the description below. So how can we not make this one of our stops, you guys. So this is number three, Savile Row, which was the Apple Studios. And in 1969, all four Beatles fell on the roof of that very building, and they performed a live open air concert in the middle of central London. But what we know now, which of course we didn't know on the day, this was the very last time all four Beatles would ever play together live. Now, an incredible gig. They wanted some footage for the Let It Be movie. So they decided why not use it on top of the building they owned, the yeah, Apple Studios. And they did most of their recording here outside of Abbey Road. Um, when they spontaneously got on that roof, crowds of people started to assemble and particularly around down here by the uh, telephone box you will see it in the let it be movie footage so keep an eye out for that when they did finish their amazing gig John Lennon made some famous quip about thank you for joining us I hope we passed the audition um, but 1969 the very last performance of the Beatles on the 30th of January 1969 of course I go into a lot of detail about that in our rock and roll tour you guys so they put up this blue plaque to commemorate the 50th anniversary of that. So now it's not so much a secret as it was before. And uh, yeah, check out that footage in the Let It Be movie. It's pretty special. Get Back is amazing. But of course there were complaints in the neighborhood about the noise, particularly from this building here, which is directly behind it. And it was a bank. They called the police and the police threatened to shut them down. So we actually only managed to get 42 minutes of footage, but still just in a monumental event in Beatles history. Number three, Savile Row in the home of the Apple Studios. Now the door there has been synonymous with, well, has become infamous rather for Beatles fans. Everybody wants to get their photograph taken here at number three. I can't even mention the fact that it's now owned by Abercrombie and Fitch Children's Department, but alas, there's not much we can do about that. You should be able to get in the building. A lot of recording was done down here as well in the basement. So it's an incredible place. And the man who complained them to the Beatles worked in that bank here. So last stop coming up, you guys, we're gonna head for a very famous venue where the Beatles played several times at Sunday night at the Palladium. And the Palladium is just off Oxford Street. Okay, just another short journey from Savile Row to the London Palladium, which is situated on Argyle Street, just off of Oxford Street. Now you guys, I'm just off Oxford Street and I came down here because I wanted to show you the blue plaque dedicated to the offices of Brian Epstein of course, the manager of the Beatles. His offices were here from 64 to 67, 1964 to 67. And of course, he's the very reason the Beatles exist today. 
Um, he saw the talent when so many others didn't. In fact, I think it was Decca Records refused the Beatles. They said that bands and uh, guitars were on the way out. More fool them. Brian Epstein saw the potential though. And his offices were here, very, very successful and a huge influence and a huge part of the very reason the Beatles are here today. But this is the London Palladium. Now this is a very famous venue here in London. It's a stunning building inside. So you'll see Diane Warwick is playing there. Wow. Oh, Roger Daltrey's there as well on Sunday, 17th of July. But a very famous TV show used to be broadcast from here and it was Sunday night at the Palladium. I guess it was kind of on a par with um, Oh, the Ed Sullivan show uh, in the US at the time. And this one really kind of brought the elderly and the young together and everybody chilled out and watched this together on a Sunday night. But there was one, one night that the Beatles were scheduled to perform. Now there was insanity. Now because the Beatles were right in the center of central London and very close to Fleet Street where all the press were, they had moved up from Liverpool because Wow, this is where the scene was at. All the recording studios and all the newspaper outlets and the TV stations and the concerts. Plus it was an eight hour journey at the time from Liverpool to London. So when they did move up here, uh, a very famous gig of theirs was Sunday night at the Palladium. Thousands upon thousands of maniac Beatles fans arrived. And you've all seen the footage the screaming hormonal teenage girls, the crying, the fainting, the dramatics, the concert footage, the airport footage. Well, this was no exception because all the press arrived and they saw this incredible euphoric state and manic state, if you like, of the Beatles fans screaming and crying. And this is where we believe the term, the term Beatlemania originated from because the Daily Mail the following day, after taking so many photos of the fans that, that, that night. Uh, they'd known that the, literally Beatles fans knew uh, where the Beatles were going to be before the Beatles knew themselves. Um, he had said that they were, I think Paul McCartney was quoted as saying they're the eyes and ears of the world. But that's where the term Beatlemania was coined that night as a result of the Sunday night gig at the Palladium. Now, ladies and gents, so that's coming to the end of the tour. We are. With Tim and with, with my taxi driver, Tom, Tom the taxi driver, I'm going to get him out to say goodbye to us all. He's been amazing. So check out his channel. His channel is a bit different to ours. It's more about lo logistically how he works out routes in London. So he's been filming today as I've been filming as well. So I'm going to head my goodbyes in one second. Let me just have a quick chat with him here. Tom, we're going to finish up this part of my tour today. So I want to say thank you so much, honey. Thank you very Best much. Best of luck with your video. Yes. And I'll be keeping an eye out for me and your video. And you keep an eye out for you and my video. It's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, this is Tom, the taxi driver. Don't forget, check him out here on YouTube, his channel. Tom, the taxi driver channel. That's it. Excellent. And I look forward to working with him again. So this is Sinead signing out in London, folks, again with Tom. See you soon.